Hi everyone, my name's Lorna and I'm from Holton Libraries and I'm being joined today by Richard and Adele from Holton Libraries and Wendy and Gemma from Darsbury Labs. Um, we are here today with a special space session for you all to enjoy. So sit back, relax and take a trip into space. Wonderful. Okay, so my name is Wendy from Darsbury, as Lorna's just mentioned, and I'm really excited to be part of this session today. I've worked at Darsbury Laboratory for many, many years, and I couldn't think of anywhere better to work. So over to you, Gemma. Hi, everyone. So I'm Gemma. I work at Darsbury Laboratory with Wendy. I've been there about three and a half years now, um, and we both work in the public engagement team. So we love talking about science, technology and engineering. Uh, so I've got a couple of slides to show you, um, so I'm going to just share my screen now. Let me know if you can see what I'm sharing. Is that coming up okay for everyone? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, okay. So I thought we'd start out by actually showing you a picture of Darsbury Laboratory. So this is the lab where Wendy and I usually work. Obviously things are a little bit different at the moment. Um, and you can tell we're both working from home, although Wendy looks like she's working from outer space today. Ooh, <laughs> floating around with the planets. <laughs> uh, so normally we'd both be coming in through these front doors every morning, um, but we're not doing it that at the minute. We're missing it a lot. But it's nice to talk about the science anyways. Um, oh, sorry. Did you want to talk, Wendy, a little bit about some of the work we do? Yeah, I could just give a little brief overview. So. As we mentioned, Darsby Laboratory, we do really, really cool science, but we don't do space science. That takes place at our other laboratories around the UK. But at Darsby, we've built amazing machines called particle accelerators. Now, these machines, they accelerate particles, which are tiny, tiny little things, to near the speed of light, which is faster than anything can go. And we smash them into material or we smash them into each other. And we also have machines that can magnify material up to 10 million times, that's right down to the atomic level. Why do we do this? Well, the reason is we want to study these really small things, because if we understand how they work, then we can understand more about the world around us and the universe that we live in. So we have fantastic engineers and scientists that build these things. But of course, we have to study the data or information that is produced from our experiments. So we have really powerful supercomputers on site too. And our computers are so powerful that we can address real life challenges to improve our lives. And we use them for many, many other things. And we have to observe and measure our experiments. So we design and build technology that allows us to do just that. And it's something that we're really, really good at at Darsbury. So that's a slight overview of some of the things we do amongst many other things. Okay, thank you very much for that, Wendy. So to start off, I have got a little bit of a quiz for everyone here and everyone watching. Uh, whenever we talk about space, we always start out by talking about the daytime sky. So what I want you all to do is imagine that you're walking out of your front door or you're looking out the window up at the sky. What sorts of things might you be seeing in the daytime sky? Now, I've had a little bit of a think myself, um, so I've got some clues for you, and let's see if um, you can read my mind mm. and guess what I've been thinking about in the daytime sky. Well, there's a clue on the screen there because there's lots of clouds yeah. in the background. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to see the sun. We don't see enough of that. <laughs> Absolutely right, Lorna. So we've got the sun over here, good. Can I Rainbow. Have one, oh, Richard's jumped in before. Oh, Richard, me. what was that? Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> Brilliant. Yep. So, seeing a lot of rainbows these past few months, mainly pictures of rainbows in people's windows. Uh, so, I thought we'd get uh, we'd get rainbow up there. So, we've got sun and rainbow. What was can your I, one, Wendy? Can I back you on? I'm itching here. I'm jumping up and down on my street. Um, moon, because you can't see the moon in the daytime sky. Yeah, absolutely right. So what you will find is that Wendy and I love a bit of a trick question. Uh, so moon is up there, even though we tend to associate that with as more of a nighttime thing. 
but you can see the moon in the daytime from time to time. Uh, so that leads this bottom row here, which I think is a little bit more tricky. So I have got it's some not picture aeroplane. Plane. Oh, absolutely right, Adele. We've got aeroplane here. We're starting to see a few more of those in the sky. And these two here, I'll bring the clues up, see if that's any help. Oh, bird. Oh, no, cool. Bird. <laughs> yep, birds flying in the sky. And last but not least, what's this one? Leaves. <laughs> leaves, good. <laughs> so sometimes you can see leaves blowing around. We'll be seeing this more and more as we go into autumn. Perfect. Okay, so there's the right answers. So from the daytime sky, we'll now move on to the nighttime sky. So this time, I want you to imagine that you're maybe peeking out of your bedroom window when it's really, really dark. What types of things might you be seeing in the nighttime sky if you're very lucky? So again, I've had a think myself. So let's see if you can guess what I've been thinking about. Any ideas? Oh, there's mine back again. Can I put my hands up for this one, please? Go on, Wendy. Moon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely right. So we have got the moon there again. Milky bar. Way. Oh. Well, well done, Adele. So we've got Milky Way, not the chocolate bar, but uh, in fact, that is the name for our galaxy. Now, where we live with the bright lights of Manchester, Liverpool, all of Holton and Warrington, we're unlikely to see the Milky Way. You'd only ever see this if you were somewhere really, really dark, like out at sea, or maybe if you were camping somewhere really remote. But if you're very lucky, you'd be able to see the brightness of those 100 billion stars shining down on us. So it is there, even though sometimes we can't see it. Uh, so we've got Moon and Milky Way. Richard, I think you had one, didn't you? Yeah, bat. Bat, good, <gasps> brilliant. So sometimes you can see bats flying around. I saw quite a lot of bats in the summer, actually. Yeah, so they're really fast, aren't they? Yeah, they're quite frightening when you're not sure quite what's going on. Uh, so bat, moon and Milky Way. And the final three longer ones. I've brought some clues up for you. Oh, satellite. Satellite, good. Yeah, so this one here is a satellite uh, so you can have man-made satellites like the international space station or the moon is a natural satellite because it orbits around the earth uh, so final two here and here constellation oh very good i think we got them both there so adele got constellation so that's a pattern made up by stars in the night sky wendy's going to talk much more about those in a moment and who was it that said planet I did, I said planet. Well done, Lorna. So we've got planet as well. Quite long words, some of those. Yeah, there were some long ones there. Brilliant, well done. Uh, and final question. I don't know about any of you, but I'm a bit of a Disney fan. And there's a fairly recent Disney film where the main character can use the constellations, the stars, to help her navigate around. I wonder, does anyone know which Disney film this is from? Oh. Adele, I thought you were about to say it there. You were kind of mouthing the first line. I'm thinking there. more Richard, mate, because he's got younger children than me. Richard, do you know? He's got very good songs. That's all I'm going to say. I think Ethan's been to see it, but he went to see it with Claire. He didn't want to go to see it with me. I can't remember what it was. Shall I put you out of your misery? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is Moana. Ah, that was it. <laughs> Can you give us a song out of it, Gemma? <laughs> I, I'm not going to put you through that. <laughs> but there are some good ones. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I think you did very well in my little quiz there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Wendy now to start the Stellarium show. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Gemma. That was a really great introduction there. Thank you. So let's just uh, get the IT out of the way. Can you see Darsby Laboratory? Uh, not quite yet. Yes, now we can. Yes. I always feel oh, relieved yeah. 
<laughs> when it comes up because there's always that touchy moment you think oh is it going to work or not brilliant so it's here so this is Darsby Lab, which is only 10 minutes up the road from Woodness and, and Runcorn. Um, hopefully quite a few of the viewers of this video will recognise the big tower there in the background. So this is where me and Gemma work. And this is a beautiful day in the middle of September. And we have two objects in that beautiful blue sky. So my question to you is, what are those objects? The star. Brilliant. So this big one here is the sun. And if I click on it, you should see the word up in the top corner there. Uh, we don't look at the sun directly because it's very, very dangerous for our eyes. But it's there and it's beautiful. And we also have the moon, which is here. It looks a little bit smaller on this image. It's just the way the software displays it. My second question to you is, can you see any stars in that bright blue sky? Hmm. Is this a trick question, Wendy? Possibly. Meaning, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's got you all thinking now, hasn't it? I can't see any. No. Adele, Lorna? Well, the, I I oh, the sun. The sun is the star, isn't it? Oh, of course. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> That's the trick question because our star is the sun. So there is one bright star in that um, blue sky. Of course, the stars are actually there. It's just with the light shining on our atmosphere and bouncing around, it obscures the view of the stars. But we do have that one beautiful one right in the middle. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move west because the sun sets in the west. And I'm going to move time forward at the moment, right at the bottom of the screen here, we've got round about 10 past 10 in the morning. So if I go forward a little bit faster, buttons are quite sensitive on this software, so I'm going to go too fast, maybe press it once more to go a little bit faster. You will then see the moon and the sun appearing above the Darsbury Laboratory uh, building. Uh, it's now about 11 o'clock in the morning. There you can see the moon. And in a minute, you will see the sun. And of course, it's not the sun that's moving. It's the earth that's rotating. that gives it the appearance that the sun is moving across our sky. So I'm going to get to about half past seven at night. The moon's dipping on the horizon now. And the sun is dipping behind the tree. Get to about half seven when it's a really, really lovely time of night. Round about there will do nicely. And the reason I wanted to stop it there was to just talk about this time of night a little bit. It's called sunset or twilight. And it's a lovely time of night just before the stars start to come out. And Gemma mentioned a little bit earlier that we suffer with a thing called light pollution. And when we look at the stars in our sky, sometimes it's a bit obscured when we live in a built up place. We have to go out into the countryside to get to see really good stars. So in Warrington, Runcorn, Liverpool, Manchester, Witness, all surrounding areas, we do have a fair amount of light pollution from cars, buildings, factories, shops, everywhere around us. But if you do manage to get into Wales or Scotland or the countryside or even out to sea on a boat, you will get to see really good skies and even the Milky Way. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, if we go forward in time again, I want you to keep your eye on the sky and point at the screen or look at the screen for the first objects that start to appear. So I'm going to go just a little bit faster. The clock at the bottom now is moving quickly towards eight o'clock. And you'll probably start to see some objects appearing round about here. Oh, I can see one. Yeah, can you see this here? Yeah, yeah, right here. yeah, here, here. This is a very famous shape here, which we'll be is talking about. Is that the plow? Ah, well done. We'll be talking about that a bit later on. But yes, it is. Very observant of you. So I'm going to stop time there. And as you can see, there's a silhouette happening here, which we want to get rid of. So I'm going to take away the land. So that's taken away the earth and all the buildings. Now the sun that dipped on the horizon is down here, um, but it's still bouncing around our atmosphere and all of the particles and gases in our atmosphere. So I'm gonna take the atmosphere away so that we've just got the sun. 
there. And as you notice, we've got some really big, bright objects here. There are lots and lots of stars, but we've got some really big ones here. So my question to you is, what are they? So has anybody got any answers for me? Are they either planets or satellites? Can you see great. satellites like that? Great, great answer, Adele. In actual fact, this one is a star called Arcturus. Really, really, really big star. This one is also a star. But this one here and this one here are not stars. Before I ask you what they are, I'm just going to point out that this one here is the moon. Because remember the moon and the sun dipped on the horizon? See there in the corner it says the moon. So just so you know, that one there is um, the moon and that one is the sun. But what are these two here? They're not stars. So what else could they be? Hard to tell looking at this screen because they look just like all of the other objects. Mm. <coughs> Any guesses? And they're not, did you say they're not planets? Um, well, actually they are planets. Oh. Uh. Well done. This one here is Mercury. And this one here is Venus. And Venus is one of the brightest objects in the night sky, especially in the summer months, because it's re it shines really, really bright. They call it the morning star and the evening star because it's the first star that you see in the evening and it's the last star you see in the morning. It isn't a star, it's just nicknamed that. It's actually a planet, obviously. Um, and one way that you can check, am I looking at a star or am I looking at a planet in the night sky? Well, stars are very, very, very far away and they look like little tiny pinpoints of light. And the light has to travel an awful long way to get here, like billions and billions of light years to get here. And then it has to travel through our solar system. And then it has to travel through our atmosphere here on Earth. And our atmosphere has got different layers of density. So as the light is traveling through it, it has to bend in different ways. It's called refraction. And as it lands in our eyes, it appears to make the star look like it's twinkling. A planet, on the other hand, is a lot closer because it's within our solar system. And it almost, they appear like little disks in the night sky. They're a little bit round at looking rather than a pinpoint of light. And obviously they don't emit their own light like our sun does. They reflect the light of the sun. So the light travels in a slightly different way to our atmosphere and they don't appear to twinkle quite as much. So I hope that's helped you with your stargazing next time you're out there and you're looking at these objects and you're thinking, hmm, is it a planet? Is it a star? Is it twinkling? Does it look like a pinpoint? Is it a little bit bigger? And this helps with your investigation when you're looking at the night sky. So I think you assume everything is just a star when you look yes. up at the, the night sky. Yeah, even looking at the screen now with all these little objects on it, you could think that all of these look similar and they all look like stars but you can see the planets. And actually, we were talking a little bit earlier on, before we came onto the recording, about the apps that you can get on your phone. Is that right, Adele? It is, yeah. I didn't want, I don't want, um, I don't know which, um, the best app that I can download. Yeah. So we need to look into that and maybe just look at the reviews because there are lots of them out there. And Gemma, you've got one on your phone, haven't you? Yeah, so I've actually got two on my phone. I've got, the, the phone version of Stellarium, which is the software that Wendy's using right now. So you can download that in app form. And I've got another one called SkyMap. So between the two of those, they kind of do everything that, that I want them to do with the mobile app. I think they work quite well. And I've, I've even been using them a little bit over the summer as well, if I manage to stay up late enough. <laughs> Wonderful. So they're really, really helpful, actually. And they get you to recognise the different parts of the sky. So going back to the show, I'm going to take off the, the planets and the sun because it's a little bit distracting. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull the sky over this way because I want to talk about this group of stars that are in the middle here. Can you all see three stars in a row in this area? Yes. So this is what we call a constellation of stars. Now a constellation is a pattern in the night sky of a certain group of stars. And many, many years ago, our ancient ancestors 
um, in this particular instance, our Greek ancestors. They made patterns in the night sky to help them remember where those stars were because they didn't have iPads, they didn't have sat -nars, they didn't have maps. And when they were out navigating around, the only way they knew where they were going was by, by, by the night sky. So this helped them remember where they were. And to also help them remember, they created stories around these patterns. And there are many, many, many different types of stories around our constellations. And today we're going to be talking about this group here. And the giveaway is those three stars in a row right in the middle. Does anybody know what this group of stars could be called, given those three that are right in the middle? Hmm. Orion's Belt. Brilliant. Some people know it, some people don't. Um, yeah, this is Orion's Belt. Now, Orion is a hunter, a big, giant, powerful hunter in the night sky. Let me point him out for you. Here's one shoulder. Here's another shoulder. This is his belt and his waist. This is one leg. This is another leg. This group here is the sword that's hanging off his belt. There's an arc of stars here, which is his shield or his bow and arrow, because he's a big, powerful hunter. Could even be the fleece of an animal. And you can't see it too well here, but his arm will be held up in the air with a club. Now, it's still quite hard to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join um, these stars together. Let me just get all of the other ones off um, for now. And let me see if I can just get them on on their own. Oh, this is quite tricky. Let's try once more. Click on that. Ah, finally. Okay, so we've got Orion on his own there. So let me point him out again. Shoulder, shoulder, waist, one leg, another leg, shield, fleece, animal, whatever you want to call it, arm in the air. Can you see him? Yeah. yeah a little bit. Him with a bit of imagination. A bit of imagination. Yeah. Should we put some artwork on it to make it a bit clearer? Yeah. So there he is, Orion the Hunter in the night sky. You will always be able to see his belt. Round about November to February are the best times to view it. Because in the summer months, he's dipped on the horizon because the stars are moving around all the time, depending on the rotation of the Earth. Um, so, what I want to point out now, to take the art away, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the science um, in Orion, because we've got two really, really bright stars here, one there and one there. Now, this one here is a red supergiant star. This one here is a blue supergiant star. And the reason that they're different is this one that's called Betelgeuse is quite an old star and it's burning up a lot of its fuel. And as stars get older, they grow in size because the gases start to expand. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's getting older and older and burning up all of this fuel. So it's glowing in a different way. This one here called Rigel is a younger star because it's not burnt up as much of its fuel. It's quite a bit smaller, but it's glowing in a different way. It's much brighter because it's got more fuel. And Betelgeuse, I'm going to uh, pass over to Gemma here because this is one of Gemma's favourite stars and she's going to tell you why. Star, yeah, it is a star, not planet. Get mixed in here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you, Wendy. So uh, Betelgeuse is my favorite star um, I think because it's very easy to spot in the night sky so when you're just starting out with stargazing it's a good one to look for it's a slightly different color as well so that makes it stand out uh, so I actually ended up naming my cat Betelgeuse but I only found out fairly recently I think we found this out together actually when didn't we that Betelgeuse yeah. means giant armpit so I'm now stuck with a cat Called giant <laughs> I think looking at that artwork, I probably should have figured that one, one out a little bit sooner. <laughs> That's a great story. I love that. And in actual fact, Rigel on the other end is, is giant's left foot or giant's leg. So they mean different things in Arabic. Um, I'm just going to take the artwork off again. And I just want to point out this bit here. You remember we said we have the sword here and these stars here represent the sword. Well, if I click on the middle one there and we zoom in, 
and in a bit more. It looks an awful lot different than just the normal star in the middle there. What do you think that looks like? It's very oh. colourful, isn't it? It's very mm. colourful. Is it a... a comet, is it? Well, it looks like an apple to me. <laughs> It does look like an apple. A lot of people have said that. I actually think it looks a bit like a candle that looks like a flame there. But yeah. it's kind of quite odd. It looks quite dusty and a bit candy flossy to me. I think it looks cloudy. Cloudy yeah. is a good description. Yeah. Seems to be a lot of light coming from the centre. Yeah. Mm. In actual fact, yeah. this is what we call a nebula. And a nebula is a place where new stars are being formed. There's lots of dust, there's lots of gases and particles and they're all swirling around in a big soup. And gravity is starting to act on those particles and draw them together. So all of these little white splodges that you can see are actually new stars being formed. So in a way, it's like a star factory. And I always think of it as a place of great optimism because on the one hand, we've got Betelgeuse, juice, which is a dying star. And on the other hand, in the same constellation, we've got the Orion Nebula in Orion's sword, which is where new stars are being um, formed. So I quite like that story because it makes me think a little bit more um, about the night sky. How many years does it take to, for a star to die? Oh, gosh. Years and years. Billions of years, yeah. I mean, they're all different sizes, so they all have different lifespans. But I couldn't put a number on that. In astronomical terms, it's just, the numbers are huge. It's quite hard to get your head around this, the, the length of time that some of these stars are, 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 are alive for. So, um, but, so that's a little bit about the science behind Orion. Now, I don't know if anybody noticed before when I clicked on this star here, the name of the star in the corner, Bellatrix. Mm, Has anybody ever amazing. heard of Bellatrix before? No. No. Yeah. I've heard the name, but... Yeah? So yeah, yeah, it sounds familiar. It's a character out of a very famous book and film. Oh, is it, um, what's it, uh, Asterix? <laughs> <laughs> Lorna, Adele, do you know? No. Right, I'm going to hand down. And it sounds like something we should know. <laughs> I'm going to let Gemma tell you because you're going to kick yourself when we, when we do tell you. I think I must be the only Harry Potter fan on the, the recording. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Oh, no. There'll be loads of people screaming now at the video going, oh, it's Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. So Bellatrix is a character in Harry Potter. She's a, a pretty nasty witch. Yeah. And the reason I wanted to point that out is because if we go through Orion's belt and we arrive at this big, really, really bright star here, one of the brightest in our night sky, this is called Sirius. And Sirius is the dog star. And Sirius is a character out of Harry Potter. And I believe Gemma, if I'm right in saying, he was an animagus that could turn into a dog. Yeah, that's right. So it's quite interesting because Sirius Black actually is named after one of the brightest stars in our night sky, which is quite ironic, really. Mm. So Orion likes to go hunting with the big dog in Canis Major. The big dog likes to go hunting with the little dog in Canis Minor. Now you do have to be quite inventive with some of these constellations because if I take the artwork away, I'm struggling to see a little dog there. I can definitely see a dog here with the head and the legs. Yeah. So you have to, don't get disappointed if you're looking and you think, oh, I can't see that. You'll definitely see Orion in his belt because that's quite evident. So I'm going to just bring the artwork back up a bit. I want to just take you to the final part of the show, which is if Orion goes hunting with his two dogs, he's obviously hunting an animal. What animal do you think that might be? So a lion. Throw anything out there with lion. Yeah, good try. It's not. 
but it's a good try. There is a lion in the night sky though, so it wasn't very yeah. express. Yeah. Uh, a deer. A deer. It's good, but it's not right. That sounds like a, a, a TV show. It's good, but it's not right. <laughs> a bear. Bear. Great. Great. Uh, um, bear. Yeah. Do you want me to tell you? In yeah, fact, yeah. I'll, I'll let Gemma tell you what it is. Okay. Well, maybe if I give you this clue. Um, so it's one of the zodiac signs. If you know anyone who's born end of April or beginning of May, you might know them as this sign. It's um, got big horns. Oh. Any guesses? I'm going to try uh, the Sagittarius, Virgo, <laughs> Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Not a crab. These are, these are all constellations in the night sky, though. So you're getting there. I'm going to put you out of your misery. It's Taurus the bull. The bull. Of course. <sighs> Taurus the bull. So Aldebaran is the name of this star here and this is the bull's eye. So again it's a bit tricky to find because it, the shape of it is not exactly like a bull but this bit here with the V I can definitely make out a face there because there's one horn and there's one horn. So if you imagine this bright star here is the eye and there's the other eye you can find the V shape if you look close enough. Don't forget though, when you are doing your stargazing and you're looking for these patterns, on the screen they look really small, but when you're looking outside at the real sky, you have to crane your neck right back and it's enormous. Orion's belt is huge. It covers my neighbor's house right the way across the roof. So don't forget how large these things are. So in one part of the night sky, We've got Orion, we've got the big dog in Canis Major, Canis Minor, the little dog, we've got Taurus. And can you see inside Taurus there, there's another little smudge of stars. I'll get a bit closer. Here, group of stars together, tiny little constellation within the constellation of Taurus. This is my favourite constellation because I'm one of seven children. And when I used to go camping as a child, I would always look up at the night sky to look for the seven sisters. And I always felt like it was special to me and my family because it was, it's called the Seven Sisters. It's also called the Pleiades. And if I just click on one part of it and um, zoom in and in some more, you can see that there's many more stars there than just seven. There's actually at least 250 bright stars there. So next time you go and find it, it looks like a little smudge of light in the sky. You know how to find Orion's Belt and you can work across the sky. Um, that way you will find it in the winter months and it is genuinely really beautiful so I'm going to hand over to Gemma now because this is her favorite part of the Stellarium show and um, to tell you what comes next okay thanks Wendy so yeah you're right this is my favorite bit when we bring up the pictures of all of the constellations because there's so many out there and what I'd like to invite viewers to do now is take a look at these constellations and just pick one that you like the look of because Wendy's shown you a group of constellations there and hopefully she's shown you that there's a bit of science going on there and they're all linked together by different stories as well. So if you can just choose one, I can guarantee you that there'll be an interesting story to go along with it and most likely some very exciting science happening in that part of the night sky as well. So it could be anyone you like. You've got uh, winged horses, you've got big snakes and crabs, you've got Draco the dragon or a swan. So take a little moment now and choose the one that you like. Is that a rabbit? There is a it's hare, like... isn't there? Was it a hare? Is that, was it... Is that le le leprous or lupus the hare? There's Canis Major, the big yeah. dog, I think. Oh, he says there's Orion. Can you follow the cursor? And Taurus. The Andromeda here. Gosh, so many. So the other thing I want to point out, and thank you for that, Gemma, um, is right in the middle of the screen, if I take the artwork away, I've clicked on this star right in the middle. That's why it's got a circle around it. But I want to ask you why you think that star looks different from all of the others. What is different that 
that's happening to that star that's different from all of the other stars on the screen. Mm. Staying in the middle. It's not Staying in the middle. Out. Brilliant. Thank you, Adele. It's not, it appears to not be moving, doesn't it? And that's because it's called Polaris or the North Star. So if you were stood on our North Pole and you pointed up with your hand, the first star that you'll come to right above your head would be the North Star. So it's really, really important for navigational purposes. Not because it's big or bright, it's just an average looking star. It's a position of it that makes it so important. And a little bit later on, I'm going to tell you how to find it. And one thing I want you to bear in mind, see this group of stars here. Now we did talk about them a little tiny bit at the beginning that there was a special famous group of stars that we can see in our night sky all year round. If I bring the artwork up just very quickly, you can see this group of stars is in the constellation of the Great Bear, Ursa Major. Now the North Star is on the little bird tail, just there. So I'm going to leave it there and we'll revisit this at the end of the show and I'll tell you how to find the North Star using this group of stars here to find it. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Oops. And I'm going to hand it over to Gemma to carry on with the rest of the, the recording. Okay, thank you very much for that, Wendy. That was great. Uh, so I will share my screen once more. I believe there's a couple of slides here that you wanted to share, Wendy. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, so before we move on, I just wanted to put some context about some of the stars that we've just seen. These um, objects on this slide are our planets. So Saturn hasn't got any rings on it um, on this picture, but we've got Jupiter, we've got Uranus and Neptune, and can you see how small Earth is there? It's like a little marble. Now, Earth can fit inside Jupiter over a thousand times. And Pluto, which is not quite a planet anymore, looks quite small on the screen. But it's a great comparison of how big the planets are. If we go to the next screen, now we're comparing our planets to the sun. So we know Earth fits inside Jupiter over a thousand times. I wonder how many times Jupiter can fit inside our sun. So there's a question for you. You may want to go away and do a little bit of research on that. Pluto, you can hardly even see on this picture. And like Earth, a little pixel, isn't it? Very small. <laughs> and then Earth is just like a little peppercorn here. The next picture, okay, this is more context. So the little orange blob there is our sun. Sirius, remember the dog star in the, in the uh, conversation of the big dog? That's quite a bit bigger. It's a bright star, that's why it's white on here. And these are some other big stars. Pollux and Arcturus are really, really big. Jupiter, we can't even see anymore. And then the final slide. Well, we can't even see our sun anymore because it's tiny compared to these. Sirius is now really, really small compared to Rigel, you know, the Orion's left foot. We've got Aldebaran, which is the bull's eye. But look at the size of Betelgeuse. Massive. Mm. Absolutely enormous. And Antares. And I think this is possibly one of the biggest stars that we know of. So when you look at the night sky in the future and you see all of the different stars, what you have to remember is they're all different sizes and ages. The brighter <coughs> the ones you can see the most clearly like Rigel. So I'll just leave it there and that's something for you to think about when you're next doing your stargazing. Thank you very much, Wendy. Okay, so I think you can probably read what I've got written down here. Gemma's really tricky check that you listened quiz. We do love a quiz. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully it's not too hard, but just to see if you were paying attention. Do you remember where the nebula was inside of the constellation of Orion? Was it um, underneath his belt? Yeah, that's right. So it was underneath his belt where the sword would be. So right here. And, um, so remember nebula is that big sort of colourful dust cloud. 
but what's actually happening inside of the nebula? Does anyone remember what Wendy said? S stars are being born. Yeah, that's right, Richard. Uh, so it's where stars are made. I like to think of it as being a little bit like a star factory, uh, where brand new stars are being pumped out all of the while. Okay, so I've got two pictures here of a nebula and they're the same nebula, but they were taken using different types of light. Now I'm gonna explain a little bit more about what I mean when I say that in just a second. But just for now, I want to play a little bit of a game of spot the difference. So on this side of the screen, we've got a picture of a nebula taken using visible light. So that's light that we can see with our eyes. And on this side, we have got a picture which is taken using infrared light, which is invisible to our eyes. So remember, it's the same nebula, but slightly different images. So take a look at this and see which kind of, what you can spot, which is different in these two pictures. The brightest stars on the infrared version, you can't see on the visible light version. Yeah, that's right. So you can see some really, really bright stars uh, using the infrared. Would you agree that you can see more stars in this picture yeah. as well? Yeah, so you can see yeah. more stars and they're very bright. Good. Uh, any other differences? The colours are very different as well. Yeah, so this one has got a really, really dark background, which kind of helps the, the brightness of the stars show up. Whereas this has got a bluish background um, and you can kind of see all of this light kind of penetrating the dust cloud as well. So um, yeah, slightly different colours as well, good. Any other differences? The visible light one, it looks like a big cloud and it looks like light is trying to shine through it, I think. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. So I kind of think it looks like a cloud with a light bulb maybe trapped inside of it, but you can't actually see what's going on yeah. inside of it. I've heard some people say that this one is kind of like you can see the ghost of the nebula so you can see the outline of it but you can also see through it uh, so would you all agree that you can sort of see through this nebula yeah yeah, yeah. which i think is quite interesting because it means that using this special type of invisible light we can see inside of these nebulas inside of these star factories to where the stars are actually being made, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so I wanted to explain a little bit more about what infrared light actually is. So I've got a demonstration for everyone to do now. Uh, could you please put your hands together and rub them really, really fast? Oh, heating up. Are they getting warm? Yeah. Okay, once they're nice and warm, I'd like you to put them very, very close to your face. So not touching, but so close that they are almost touching. Can you feel a little bit of heat oh. from your hands? <laughs> Adele's getting warm. Anyone else getting warm? My hands oh. are always freezing. <laughs> <laughs> what about you and um, Wendy and Richard? Can you feel any heat from your hands? There was a little bit there, yeah. Yeah? Okay, great. So that heat that you're feeling is actually a type of light. So we think of it as light, but as we can also think of it as, sorry, we think of it as heat, but we can also think of it as a special type of invisible infrared light. Um, so we can't see it with our eyes, but we can feel it with our skin. But what we can do is we can build special cameras which help us to see this invisible type of infrared light. So normally at this point, Wendy and I will be whipping out our infrared cameras, but to make it a little bit easier today, I've pulled up some pictures of infrared images from the internet. Uh, so we'll start with the house right in the middle. So you can see we've got a side by side here of a house taken using 
visible light versus infrared light. Now, in these pictures, where something is radiating lots and lots of heat or infrared light, you get the kind of yellows and oranges. So we can see in this picture, there's lots and lots of heat escaping through the windows. It's very kind of orange. There was quite a sort of yellowy orange colour there. And where it's a lot cooler, so on the roof, you've got that bluish purple. And you can do all sorts of demonstrations with these cameras. For example, if you put your hand on a table or a wall and took your hand away, you would be able to see, using this camera, a glowing handprint where you had heated up the wall or the table and now all of that heat or infrared light was glowing out. Uh, we've got a picture of the teapot here, which I think is very handy because you can see what level the hot water's up to, where you've got that yellowish glow. Um, I think I've already revealed myself as a bit of a cat lover, so we've got the cat here, a little bit of a cold nose. And this one here is probably one of my favourites. This is one that Wendy found, and that's a hairdryer. So you can see all the hot air blowing out of the hairdryer. So you can, what I think is really interesting about this type of image is you can see things which are normally invisible to us. So that hot air is normally invisible to us. The level of tea in a teapot, a handprint, all of that sort of stuff we would never ordinarily be, be able to see. But this is stuff on Earth. But what we're really interested in is finding out a little bit more about what's happening in space. So this is where the Webb telescope comes in. So this is a brand new space telescope that some of our scientists and engineers have actually been involved in building. And what's really special about this telescope is that it will have an infrared camera on board. So we'll be able to see parts of space which we've never been able to see before. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we hope, fingers crossed, that it's going to be launched next year. Uh, it's called the Webb Telescope and the little tagline is seeing our universe in a whole new light. Because it's going to be using this special type of invisible infrared light to see parts of space. So this is the cartoon version of it. And this is part of the real thing. So this is the big reflecting mirror with its golden hexagons. Um, and I think the camera will be somewhere in the middle here. This is when it was in NASA. So this has been a huge international collaboration between lots and lots of different countries, including the United Kingdom. And um, so it was over at NASA for testing when this picture was taken. And you can see all the engineers and scientists at the bottom in their special suits because uh, they don't want to get it dirty or dusty. So that's a, a really, really big clean room. Uh, was there anything you wanted to add to that, Wendy? No, other than it makes me feel quite proud to think that people in this country are working on these really, really big experiments. These are the biggest experiments in the world in, in essence, aren't they? And it makes me feel proud to think that we're a part of that. Yeah. I think we should be really proud about that. Um, I've got one thing for everyone to consider. So this is a very big telescope and we don't build rockets that big. So how do you think we get such a big bit of equipment up into space using a rocket? Any ideas? With, did you say without using a rocket? Using a rocket but the rocket is smaller than that bit of kit. So oh. you've got a few options. You could take it up in pieces, or this was a, a problem for the engineers to overcome. They've actually managed to find a way to fold up the telescope so it fits in the rocket. And then when it launches up into space, it will unfold all by itself and get into shape which I think is really, really interesting. You can find some videos online of this. Um, some people are describing it as being a little bit like origami with all the folding. I think <laughs> it's kind of like um, a flower coming into bloom 
Um, so there's been some very smart people working on that. Um, I, think that I think that's quite interesting. And that's why the mirror is actually in segments, because that's an enormous mirror. Okay, so Wendy, you wanted to talk a little bit about yeah. the plough, didn't you? Yeah, thank you very much for that. So we've covered an awful lot here today. It's all been really, really interesting and different and exciting. Um, I'm going to go back actually to when we were talking about the constellations because I did promise you that I was going to tell you how to find the North Star. So the first thing you need to do when you go outside um, on a clear night with no clouds, you've got to locate a pattern of stars called the Plough or the Big Dipper. It's called different things in different countries. The Big Dipper means a big dipping spoon. We call it the plough because, as you can see on this picture here with the horses on it, we've got an old fashioned plough there. So you've got the plough itself and you've got the handle of the plough. Um, it's called different things, the saucepan, because it looks a bit like a pan that you put on your cooker. Um, but we're going to point out the shape of it to you here. So you've got one star that it starts with on the handle. If you work your way down the handle and then you come to the bowl of the spoon or the pan or the plough itself. And then when you've done that, if you can find these two point stars and you follow up in a line, the first star you come to will be the North Star. So the North Star is hard to find until you find the And once you've got the plough and you find the point stars, go up in a line and that will be it. And the reason is, like we said before, it's not very bright, it's not very big, it's just a, a normal average of the star. But once you've done it once, you will always be able to do it for the rest of your life and you'll always be able to point out wherever you go where the north star is providing you're in the northern hemisphere that is if you're in australia you probably wouldn't see it um so that's quite a nice note to end on because it's a little job for you to go out and do in the winter months when we have our dark skies quite early on in the day so that's it for today's session um i hope you've enjoyed it i know i certainly have I mean, each time we do this, I feel like I'm learning something new and something different, and it makes me feel excited to go outside. I think it's also a lovely thing to tie in with the libraries because there's so much storytelling in our night sky. It's all based around storytelling. Mm -hmm. And the constellations that we've talked about there, we haven't actually talked about the story behind them. We've told you how to find them and what they look like, but there are stories that goes with these. There's lots of different stories about Orion. So it might be great for you to investigate that a little bit. Or perhaps you could even make your own patterns up in the night sky and make your own stories around them patterns. There's lots and lots of books in the libraries to go and read up on about all this kind of stuff. I'm sure you've got things on, on space. Lorna, Richard and Adele, you probably know more than I do about that. But what a great place to start with your stargazing to go and find out more within the library. So I'm going to hand you back over now um, to wrap up today's session, but I do hope you've enjoyed it. I know I certainly have, but I'm dying to see what comes out after this. I would love to know what people get up to in their investigations and the storytelling. So back over to you, Lorna. Oh, thank you, Wendy. That was lovely. Thank you, Wendy and Gemma, for today. I feel like I've learned so much and I'm sure everybody else will feel the same. So I can't wait to actually go out tonight. Hopefully if the clouds clear, um, and look up at the sky. I never realised there were so many different constellations. Yeah. So thank you very much. And if anyone sees Adele and Richard around Witness and Holton Lee Library and they've got any questions, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help <laughs> you find the answers. Yeah, we're, we're experts now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need the book. We'll get them on anyway, but we'll know the answer. Well, we've said quite a few of our publications out to your libraries and there's plenty to pick up when you go in. But if you've got any questions that you can't find the answers to, or you'd like a real expert that's working on the James Webb, or, or you, you want somebody that knows more stuff to come forward and talk about things, we can get questions answered for you. So please send them in, send them in via the libraries and then they can get in touch with us and we can all learn together. So thank you very much for today's session and we hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.